This is a Jack Kemp oral history project interview with former Senator and Congressman Trent Lott. Uh, today is June 13th, 2012. We're at uh, Senator Lott's office in downtown Washington, D.C., and I'm Morton Kondracki. Thank you very much for, for doing this. Glad to be with you again, Morton. Uh, so you said uh, that you first met uh, Jack Kemp in 1970 when you were an aide to Congressman Colmer, and he was brand newly elected. Do, That's do you correct. remember? the exact circumstances of your meeting? And no, it's just that um, by the 70s, I had, while I was still working for the Democrat chairman of the Rules Committee, I had crossed the Rubicon and pretty much thought of myself as a Republican, and I was particularly attracted to the, the young new stars they had, uh, Phil Crane and Jack Kemp. And um, I was uh, still involved at the time uh, in the state JCs and uh, I think I arranged for Jack to go down and speak to the state JC convention. It was the first direct contact I had with him. And, uh, you know, it just uh, was an admirer of uh, his, uh, uh, you know, his style and, and the politics that I've heard him espousing. I had watched him play football, of course, uh, when I was in law school. Uh, I always thought he was one of the slowest quarterbacks, <laughs> one of the biggest feet I'd ever seen. But I can remember distinctly watching uh, Jackie Kemp play with the Buffalo Bills. And uh, so I was just drawn to him. And then when I ran in 1972, uh, a lot of the Republicans uh, encouraged me and contributed, including Jerry Ford and uh, the then whip Les Aarons. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and then when I got uh, elected in 72, came in in 73, uh, I immediately gravitated to, to Bill Archer and, and Phil Crane and Jack Kemp. And uh, uh, Bill Archer and Jack Kemp uh, got me into a group called Chowder and Marching. And that gave me an opportunity to be with them on a weekly basis, uh, Wednesday afternoons, and uh, it really interesting discussions. And it was so helpful to me because even though I had been around for four years, I, you know, I was working for a Democrat. So it gave me a chance to get to know uh, Republicans and, and listen to some of the old bulls that were still coming, uh, you know, like uh, Rogers Morton would come to the meetings. But uh, Jack and I just became good friends, and uh, Tricia, as soon as she met Joanne, like everybody, she fell in love with Joanne Kemp, and they had a, a, a religious connection too. And so uh, it became a, a very close, uh, warm, and fruitful uh, friendship, but one that quite often led to some pretty ferocious debates. Jack and I would, you know, Jack always elicited uh, a lot of debate and discussion, and um, he was always giving me a hard time about uh, my deep south roots, and of course I was saying, what do you know from Buffalo, New York, and it went from there. <laughs> so did you have any real differences? Not very much. Uh, philosophically, we were pretty close. Uh, uh, we argued sometime uh, over issues, a little bit over education, as I recall. Uh, and then uh, as I worked into the leadership positions uh, sometime, you know, Jack influenced me when we shot down initially the, uh, the 1980, what would have been 87, 88 uh, tax bill, TEFRA. 86, yeah. No, uh, well, 80, TEFRA is 82. The tax reform is 86. Yeah. We'll get to uh, that. And, you know, I wound up uh, under his influence partially uh, uh, helping kill the rule. Uh, I never forget it was called, let's kill this snake before it gets out of the ground speech. <laughs> and uh, we took it down on the rule. and. Uh, then when we finally got to the vote, now I remember one of the things that I argued with Jack over, he wanted to exempt 10 million people from paying federal uh, income taxes, and I disagreed vigorously with that. I thought everybody ought to pay something. And that we started down that trail then, and it's gotten much, much, much worse since then. So we argued over that. But then in the final analysis, uh, I couldn't get him to vote for it. And uh, one of the, uh, by then, I, you know, I was a whip. And I remember going up the center aisle I'm pretty sure he didn't vote for it, but I remember going up, and, and he was sitting on next to the last row alone, uh, going up there and pleading with him, and I'm pretty sure that that was, I know that that happened on one occasion where I was trying I to convince him. I think it was uh, probably 82. Was it that, yeah, Tefra? Yeah, yeah he would not, he would not, I couldn't break him loose. And uh, so, um, it, it uh, but from 73 on, it was a, it was a, uh, a close relationship, and, uh, but you know, my background, I, I grew up liking to argue and being on debate teams and one of my best friends from junior high school, actually, uh, uh, still one of my best friends, is also a very liberal Democrat. And, uh, you know, we were 
I always, now that I look back on it and think, how weird were we? I remember one night sitting out in front of my house arguing with him over predestination. I mean, here's two guys in junior, I mean, juniors in high school, one a Methodist and one a Baptist, arguing over predestination. And That's we went Jack. at it for an hour. It wasn't Jack Kemp. No, uh, no. Um, so what about, what about race? I mean, you know, he, he showered, famously oh, yeah. showered with yeah. more blacks than, than lots of people have met. Sure. You're from, you're from Mississippi. Yeah. So did you ever talk about race? Sure, all, all the time. You know, Jack was, uh, you know, he was, uh, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? Uh, 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 when you're always trying to, con you know, reach out to people, convert uh, people. Uh, evangelist. Well, that wasn't the word I was looking for, but he, he was. And, and uh, first of all, some of it was uh, picking at me. Uh, you know, you're, you're, you're an old Miss cheerleader. And I said, yeah, I may have been an old Miss cheerleader, but I spent more time on the football field than you did, and you were the quarterback. So we had that exchange. And then, uh, you know, he would, he called me the, uh, the Aldemata of Mississippi. I think I, you might have heard me say that because I was always trying to get earmarks and to get money from Mississippi. And I tried to explain to him, you know, Jack, I'm from the poorest state in the nation. Uh, we need help. For many years, we didn't even ask for help. And that's why we didn't get much. Uh, I'm trying to make up a lost time. And uh, I'm, I consider that a compliment when you call me the Aldemata. But he also would talk to me about how uh, we had to reach out uh, to minorities in labor. Uh, and he knew my, you know, I have a labor background. My dad was a pipe fitter union member in, in the shipyard in my hometown. And when I practiced law, I actually, the firm I was with represented the boilermakers, the laborers, and longshoremen. And I clo closed the, uh, uh, the loan on the uh, longshoremen union halls. So I had a, uh, a connection there. And I always managed to get more labor boats than any other Republicans. But Jack helped push me in that area. He said, you know, you've got that background, you, and I actually worked on my master of laws at GW Law Center, and he said, that, you know, that I ought to push that more and Republicans should uh, be open, and I tried to do that, not with a lot of success. I remember after I became majority leader, I actually met with uh, the union leaders, uh, including, the, uh, uh, including the, the one before the current head of the FMLCIO, the head of the Teamsters, they all came in there, and I told them about my labor background and said, if you can come to me and convince me that what you're advocating is in the workers' best interest, I'll be for you. But most of the time, I think what you're doing is not in their interest. You're making them pay for stuff they don't really uh, want or get uh, a benefit from. Uh, and they never came back. Uh, but, uh, so I, I, uh, Jack worked on me on that. And he also urged me to, uh, to you know, reach out to African Americans and include them uh, uh, in our meetings and on my staff. Uh, you know, uh, he introduced me to Ernie Ladd, and I love that big picture of Ernie Ladd, Ladd, uh, Ladd fixing to crush Jack. And, and Ernie was 40 miles from where I live, which was where he is from, Mobile, Alabama. And uh, he had an influence uh, on, on uh, not necessarily on my views, but on my uh, understanding and agreeing that uh, we could do better there. A lot of people never knew it, wouldn't believe it, and probably don't even care uh, and don't want to hear it from me. But the last time I ran for re-election in 2006, my opponent, the Democratic nominee, was African-American, and I actually got 38.6% of the black vote in Mississippi. Now, I will admit that over 35 years, plus four more as a staff member, you can help a lot of people, and you don't have a place where you check race. And one thing I know about uh, African-American people, uh, citizens in Mississippi, if you help them, they remember it. Did you and I had a close, close relationship with uh, uh, Evers, um, not Major Evers' brother, Charles, Charles Evers, yeah. yeah. So uh, did you and Jack have sort of theoretical discussions about, you know, race and his, the history of racism and all that? Kind of all we did, some, um, but he was, he, was, he was more of an advocate, the, a proselytizer, that's the word I was looking for earlier. Uh, and. Uh, uh, but I, I explained to Jack that he, he didn't understand some, you know, you know how difficult it, it is sometime and, uh, in, in the South, or was, and he didn't understand. He didn't even understand how we grew up. You know, we, we grew up, uh, first of all, I grew up, in, uh, for the most part, in a town, Pascagoula, which was, uh, w did not have difficulty integrating. It was done very easily, and it was more, more open, more moderate type, but that's along the Mississippi Gulf Coast. We have a lot of military people there, a lot of African-American military people retired there. Uh, but, uh, you know, we grew up playing together, living together, and Jack didn't quite understand any of that. 
So, but I took him down there. I remember I took him down one time. Uh, one of many things that Jack advocated, uh, advocated that uh, had a great appeal to the African American community and was a good thing to do was a free enterprise areas. And uh, I got, uh, with his encouragement, uh, the free enterprise program to designate large portions of the Mississippi Delta. Enterprise zones. Enterprise zones, yeah. Free enterprise, enterprise zones. And when we announced it in Greenville, Mississippi, I took Jack down there with me. And uh, it, it was so interesting to watch him because he, he thought he knew more than he really knew. But he was surprised at the, the number of African-American people that came. Uh, the mayor was African-American. Uh, I had a great relationship with them. Uh, then we got in the car and we drove from Greenville, Mississippi to the heart of the Delta. And this is a part of Mississippi. Everybody not from Mississippi thinks that all of Mississippi is like the Delta. No, only the Delta is like the Delta. Uh, and you know, the, it's like poor, poor, white and black, but also probably 70% black in the Mississippi Delta. So I drove him from Greenville on the river up to Clarksdale, and on the way, for instance, we kept seeing these big, what looked like ponds, and he said, well, what is that? I said, that's, those are rice ponds, you know, that's where we grow rice. And uh, he said, well, do you, where do you grow your, tr your grits? I said, we, we don't grow grits, Jack. Mm. Your grits are a product of corn, you, you, you clod. And then I took him up to uh, Clarksdale, and we went to a public housing project at which, the likes of which he had never really seen either, although I'm sure he was advocate of having them. And so I took him into the project and I took him into this lady's house. Um, and uh, I had not met her before, but I wanted Jack to meet her and I wanted them to meet him. And she was cooking collard greens. You know what collard greens are. Uh, Jack didn't really know. And uh, they cook them ham hocks and they're greasy. And so I insisted that he sit down and let's eat some collard greens, and he did that, and it, uh, he, I think he was really stunned at, at uh, all he saw, the poverty, but also uh, the relationships uh, that you have with people, regardless of color, um, in a state like Mississippi, you have to. Did he, did he acknowledge that he Yeah, he something? did. He, was, uh, he, he, he said that uh, it was most, one of the most eye-opening things he'd ever done. This was when he was HUD secretary, I take it? Uh, before. It may have been when he was HUD secretary, yeah, because and I probably had gotten him to get do the enterprise zone thing. I, so it could have been when he was secretary. I, I can't really remember. I'd have to go back and check on that. Because he was, uh, this is jumping ahead, but yeah. he was uh, an advocate of, of people, uh, tenants being able to buy their own yeah. public yeah. housing. And, and you know, he developed a really close relationship with Mike Espy mm -hmm. when he was in the House. And then, he, of course, he became Secretary of Agriculture. And uh, uh, I think uh, Espy was one of the uh, early supporters of the uh, Jobs Creation Act. So That's uh, way back in the 70s. Yeah. Jobs Creation yeah. Act is 75, 76. Maybe it was the Enterprise Zones, but one of the things that uh, Jack was pushing, I remember Mike Espy was, uh, was on it, which shocked a lot of people. Uh, African-American congressman from Mississippi uh, one of the lead co-sponsors with a Jack Kemp bill. But Mike Espy is, you know, he's, he is that kind of guy. He was somebody you could work with, and I have a great relationship with him. Uh, I actually, uh, I think, actually talked to him very seriously about running for governor, lieutenant governor of Mississippi as a Republican. So uh, go, jumping back to the 70s, um, so Jack Kemp gets, gets himself involved in, in tax policy 74, 75, Jobs Creation Act and all that. So were you an ally of his in those Oh, days? absolutely. Oh, absolutely. I was always, uh, you know, and, and, you know, I think we talked about how uh, in the late 70s in particular, but it was Jack's style. I mean, he, I remember him saying, and you've heard me say this before, that we had to stop uh, just talking root canal politics, you know. You got to cut this, you got to squeeze that. It was all negative. Our language was not open and communicative, and that we had to change our language. Of course, Jack, and, and then Newt came along and helped us actually choose the words we would use. But the, the real inspiration was Jack about how we had, to, we had to be for some things. We had to be for growth and opportunity, and the Jobs Creation Act was that. And that's what was the idea behind uh, Kemp Roth, and that was the idea behind the Enterprise Zones. All those things were, were Jack's ideas. 
and all of them were, uh, you, know, ex you know, the examples of how Republicans changed their language and changed their, uh, their emphasis and started to winning. And I'll lay that on, uh, mantle on Jack's shoulders because he was the inspiration and he worked us. I mean, when we'd have a vote on the floor of the House, I mean, he'd, he was always harassing somebody like me or, or Ben or, or even a John Kyle or a Dan Coates. We were all his acolytes, you know. Um, you say harassing, you mean just... Well, he was, you know, he, he, was, he was relentless, yeah. yeah. I mean, he'd work you over. So... Uh, but I was, I was caught, I mean, uh, I like to think that my nature was like Jack's. I like to be for things, I like to be positive, I like upbeat. And so all of his message and all his ideas were just uh, you know, right down my alley. I, I loved it. So Dave Hoppy, who was his, uh, was both of your yeah. chiefs of staff at one time, said mm -hmm. that he'd never seen Jack so stunned as when he came back from a Chowder and Marching Society meeting after having been beaten up by senior Republicans. You must have been there. For I'm some sure of I was there because I, I. Do you remember any of those? I, I can't remember what the issue would have been, but I I do vaguely remember that he probably did get hammered a few times, uh, probably by some of the old bulls like Al Cedarberg and uh, Davis, what was his name from Wisconsin, maybe even Mel Laird, who would come. Uh, Jack was rocking the boat, I mean, but we were the, we were the. They called us, what did, they had nick all kinds of names for us. We were, we were the young revolutionaries. We were the blow dry group, remember? Because uh, a lot of us, Jim Martin from North Carolina had the shock of hair like Jack and Carol Campbell and a whole group of us. And uh, we were all in chowder marching. Dave Treen was in there too, Carol Campbell from South Carolina. And uh, uh, I suspect that the, they were, I, I do remember that there were some times when they got on him pretty good. But I don't remember a particular incident. It was, uh, the way it's been represented to me is that it was because he was outside his lane. In other words, he, he, well, was, he, he was getting into tax policy and he wasn't on ways of Yeah, and, and also, uh, I think he was on appropriations, but he wasn't an appropriator. That's why I think Al Cedarberg was probably one of the ones who gave him a hard time. What do you mean he was on appropriations? But he, uh, he, 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 didn't come, he didn't come to Congress to spend money. And yet he was on appropriations committee. It didn't. He he would be better on ways and means. Right. But you know, I mean, Thad Cocker and I had that. That uh, he was Thad's on appropriations, and I was on finance. We really should have been the other way around. Um, so by 1978, Kemp tax policy, Kemp Roth, goes from being something that's not recognized by the the senior Republicans to being Republican policy. Yeah, absolutely. So how did that happen? Well, I think that uh, we had achieved, uh, or were beginning to achieve critical mass in the Republican conference by 1978. If you look at the, you know, uh, the makeup, uh, who was there, Connie Mack and, and Bob uh, Walker and Carol Campbell and Bob Livingston and uh, Ben Weber and, uh, you know, uh, Dick Cheney, did I mention Dick Cheney? We were all there. Uh, and we were the, you know, we were the revolutionaries, and Jack was our leader. He was our spiritual leader. Now, Jack was undisciplined as a leader. That's why he needed, modestly, somebody like me that would actually take the time to count the votes and try to, try to help make it happen. And he was out there driving it, you know, with a vision, but uh, somebody else had to do the, the routine work. But we so had, you weren't yet... You weren't yet leadership, but you were no, acting in as, 78, as the No, in 78, I was the... elected as chairman of the research committee. That was my first entry-level leadership position, which put, uh, put me in the, in, the, in the chairs. And then 80 was when I got elected whip. In the aftermath of, uh, of Kemp's ideas being adopted by Reagan and Reagan getting elected. What do you And know? I, I still argue with my, uh, my, my friends in the House and Senate, don't wait for the Republican nominee. You get out there, help decide the agenda, develop the agenda, promote the agenda, and let the nominee adopt the agenda. And Reagan took the House Republicans' agenda, you know, lock, lock stock, and barrel, the whole thing, on the defense side, on the uh, tax policy, uh, and it was, ma it was made to order for Reagan anyway. It was a perfect fit. But Jack was the guy that, you know, I'm convinced uh, got him to adopt what we had been pushing. Henry Hyde was in that group. We had a group of, uh, of 30 of us in the House 
that originally uh, early on uh, said so we're, we're, we're on the Reagan team. And remember, uh, beginning in 1979, uh, he was considered by some as too old and, you know, having no chance at all. But he had that cadre in the house, and he included us. He met with us. Uh, it was a, it was well, t tell me about your relationship, your own relationship with, with Ronald Reagan. Uh, well, uh, I had, of course, uh, been involved in the 76 fiasco, and somewhat typically of me, uh, I, I felt like Jerry Ford deserved uh, the chance to continue, so I supported Ford. And then that led um, to the, you know, the knockdown drag out at the convention where Mississippi voted 16 to 14 for Ford. The delegation split 16, 14, it was ugly. And the scars from that, that experience still exist to, till this day in Mississippi. Billy Munger and Clark Reed have hated each other ever since. You recognize those names. Uh, but uh, because of that, I, I, I saw what was coming and I, I did not even go to the convention. I didn't run to be a delegate. And, uh, but the, that leads to the, uh, the 80 situation. I, uh, I felt badly about it from then on, especially after we lost. And then I made a, a decision early on, actually I made the decision under the influence of a, uh, a congressman from Minnesota uh, at Windsor Castle uh, to support Reagan. And I came back to Mississippi and made the call in Windsor Castle in Uh-huh. I was there for a, a, a conference, uh, Adam Smith conference. And uh, I flew back uh, and uh, called and and this is actually 1979, and said, I want, to, I want to be the state chairman in Mississippi for Reagan. And at that point, I guess they were glad to get anybody. So I was the chairman in Mississippi in 80. And so I had, to, you know, I had contact and worked with his regional people. And uh, Mississippi, uh, we had lost Mississippi to Carter by 10,000 votes. In order to carry the state for Reagan, we had to carry my district by, I think, about 40,000 vote margin. And we did. And we carried the state by 10,000 votes over Carter for Reagan in 1980. So that was considered a, you know, to get Mississippi to vote uh, for a, a Republican from California named Ronald Reagan over a Southern Baptist incumbent from Georgia was, was a challenge. Which, but we haven't lost Mississippi to you know, the Democrat since. <laughs> which year was it that uh, Reagan announced in Philadelphia, Mississippi? He didn't announce in Philadelphia, Mississippi, but uh, he went to Mississippi and he gave a fan, had a huge crowd. It was a great event, and it got hammered in the New York Times because he, you know, he's, he, he uh, advocated states' rights. Uh, which, is this 80 or something? This is 80. 80. Mm -hmm. and did and you influ in, in, influence him to go to Philadelphia? Absolutely. And, uh, you know, and I had a running war with Jim Baker, who was involved in the campaign by then. Uh, and... Uh, Basically, they didn't want him to go to Philadelphia, and, and I kept insisting that he go. And why? Find, why? Why Philadelphia? Because it, it because it's 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 the biggest political house party, probably in the South. Uh, all political candidates go there. Dukakis campaigned there. I took Jack Kemp there, and he cursed me because he said it was the most the hottest he'd ever been in his life. And people in Mississippi and Jack never wore an undershirt or t-shirt. Well, you know, no politician goes into a crowd in the South without a T-shirt on because you'll be ringing wet the whole time. So he had on a blue shirt, no undershirt. So he's, it, it turns dark blue instantly. And in Mississippi, we're hands-on politicians. We hug you, we slap you on the back, we shake your hands with both hands. And it was an, another new experience for Jack. But, uh, but Reagan went, and uh, I knew it'd be a hugely successful event. But then I told uh, Baker and them, we want to present him with a Greg Harkins rocking chair. Uh, uh, actually, it was a, uh, I believe it was a double rocker. Uh, this chair maker, are you familiar with, you know what rocking chairs are, cane bottom rocking chairs. We had this guy that is, was uh, well, not well known and his rocking chair was sold all over the South and he would make these double rockers. And I said, we want to present him with a rocker. And Baker said, absolutely not. You know, I can just see it now, the old man sitting there in a the rocker. So uh, we went right around. Finally, uh, 
we come up, they have the stands, they have this horse racing with the, the, the two wheel horse races, I don't even know what you call it. Salty? And I don't even know what it is, but they have those races every year in Philadelphia. And we came over the back side of the, the track and the crowd was there. 60,000 people were lying in those tracks and, and huge roar. And uh, I had my, my co-chairman in Mississippi were John Bell Williams, Tom Abernathy, Bill Calmer, three Democrats, and the, uh, the chairman, Democrat chairman of the State Board of Supervisors. And so he gave a speech, it was a great speech, and when he finished, we gave him a rocking chair. Because they didn't have a Secret Service that could, could block us in those days, so we just put the chair up on the stage. And Baker didn't know we were gonna do it. And, and what did Reagan do? It was the most masterful thing, and I, I, I don't think it was planned. I think it was uh, instantaneous. He walked over, sat down, reached up, and grabbed Ms. Reagan by the hand and pulled her down in his lap. <laughs> and that was the picture that went all across America. Not an old man sitting in a rocket chair, but uh, the candidate putting a move on his wife right there in that rocking chair. It was, it was, a, it was a, great, a great event. So now, Philadelphia, Mississippi is famously the place where the three civil rights workers were killed in 1964. So what did Jack Kemp think about Ronald Reagan's, I mean, it was a major. I don't know that we ever discussed that. And he, he you know, people in, in Mississippi don't think of Philadelphia. This, this, is, a, this is the biggest political event in, in election year in the state. It's, it's where that happened. It's never been connected to that. Uh, Republican, Democrat, liberal, everybody campaigns there. Uh, but I'm sure Jack would have said, first of all, Jack would have said, don't go to Mississippi. And he would have certainly said, you know, uh, you know don't go to Philadelphia. But, uh, but you don't recall any such no, conversation? No, I don't think he ever tangled with me over that. Uh, but quite frankly, I probably kind of thing I wouldn't discuss with him anyway, because I had my head set and, uh, we we're going to do it. So what, By the way, but I mean, he carried the state and he carried the South. What was, uh, what was Kemp's relationship like with Reagan? You know, during the, that period in the 80s, uh, I think, well, you know, he worked for Reagan uh, when he was governor in California. And of course, we got some stories about some un un difficult or unusual uh, act, you know, things that happened d during that period out there in California. But Jack had an entree with him that uh, uh, most of the rest of us didn't have. And uh, clearly, I remember we went out to a meeting one night out in, in Virginia, maybe even Middleburg or somewhere out there at some residence. And I think Jack had engineered that. We took our cadre of, uh, of uh, 30 or so house members out there. And uh, this was, I can't remember when it was, but it was at a critical moment and it was a great uh, uh, experience. So I think Jack was, answered your question, I think he was uh, you know, very, very much involved and could talk to the, the governor uh, and, and president, what became President Reagan. I think after the president was elected, they reached a point where their relationship kind of cooled off, and, and I'm not sure uh, why. Um, I, suspect, uh, I suspect that Baker was running interference there sometime, and. Uh, uh, and then one time, you know, Kemp and I shot down the, uh, their Social Security effort. Remember that one? That was 83. And whenever it was, the House, it the was Senate. Bob had, Dole's idea, right? Yeah, and the Senate had passed it. The minute she was involved. In fact, I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure the minute she ever forgave me for that, but uh, uh, Jack, Jack and I did collude and publicly blasted it and helped keep it from ever moving in the House. So between, before, before Reagan gets elected president, did you have a, what, what was your sense of the kind of communication that there was between Jack Kemp and, and I Reagan? thought that uh, b during, before and, uh, and during the election that he had uh, a good relationship, a, a regular uh, relationship and input, not only with the, and he knew all the campaign operatives, you know, he knew Knopf Singer and um, who was the PR Sears. man. Oh. And Sears and John Sears, although I, I had the impression that he and Sears didn't G Hall a whole lot. Uh, but uh, who was the, the third one in that group? 
the one that was a public relations guy. Deaver. De yeah, Mike uh, Deaver. He had a, a, a communication, as I recall, with them. I know he uh, he had uh, you know involvement uh, with them throughout the campaign. Now, before it, there was there was a plot, uh, quote unquote, uh, by Arthur Laffer and Jude Winiski, whereby Jack would actually and Bill uh, uh, Irving Crystal apparently was part of it too whereby Jack was going to run for president against Reagan in 1980. Did, I never did knew you? that, and I would have been against it at the time. Now, I did support Jack in 1988, even when I was running for the Senate. And uh, I, I'm not sure the Bushes ever forgave me either. Yeah, we'll get to that. Okay. <laughs> but so, the, the, how much did you discuss, and, and how early, what Jack's long-term political future ought to be like? I'm not sure we really discussed that that much. But that's what politicians talk about all the time. Yeah, but then you know, by the '80, you know, I was a whip, and I was I was very much involved in the legislative process and working with the White House. But when we go to the White House, Jack was the number three in leadership too. He was chairman of the conference, and Chain and Dick Cheney was in the leadership then too. Um, and so, but I don't know. Maybe I was so focused on on the House and what I was doing. At that time, I didn't really, I don't recall really colluding or, or uh, talking to Jack about all that. I do remember distinctly uh, talking to him, I guess it would have been then in 87, uh, because then he was getting ready to, to run. And I never will forget the conversation because I said to him, Jack, by then I'd learned a lot of lessons the hard way. You know, uh, I think you probably ought to do it, but before you do it, make sure that you have assessed everything that is in your closets, because it will come out. And whatever it is, make sure Joanne and your family know all about it. Um, I think that was in '87, and that, I guess it was it was late in the '80s before we really started to talking about uh, what he could do next or what he ought to do. And, uh, I thought the time was right. And you've seen the video of my introducing him in the House uh, chamber, and what a great crowd we had lined up there. Um, this was when he announced. Yeah, but um, I was worried. Uh, that he would be an undisciplined candidate, and that uh, I was concerned that he didn't have uh, strong enough uh, people around him and advising him. Um, but I, you know, I never was because I was running for the Senate race. I never was that directly involved in his campaign. I'm not sure I would have been anyway. Uh, I'm not sure Jack considered me that much of a political operative. I think he considered me more of a inside the chamber, inside the ballpark sort of guy. Uh, go, going back to uh, to 1980, were were you at the convention in 80? You weren't. You didn't go to the. Convention. No, no, I didn't oh, go oh, in right. 76. 76 you didn't. Yeah, I went in 80. I was co-chairman of the platform committee. Bill Brock, another chowder and marching guy. Uh, it was the House's turn and rotation uh, to uh, be. Well, the chairman was um, John Tower, and I was the co-chairman with Tower from the House, and. Uh, uh, that was a, a great experience too. Was that the year that you had Jack be the defense subcommittee? No, chairman? that was 1984. I was chairman of the platform committee then. Since I'd done it, uh, co-chair in '80. Then, when the rotation came up in '84, I was I was a, cha a chair, and Jack was on that platform committee. It was quite a group. Uh, we had all of our young revolutionaries there, and Dave Hoppy was there, and Bill Gribben. Actually, we rewrote the platform. I'm, I'm to this day proud of that platform. You know, go back and take a look at it for whatever they're worth. That was the one also where we did the famous comma. Remember that? I do. Now was the comma, this is the 84 convention, the comma, explain the comma. Well, uh, I can't remember exactly what the, uh, the comma, uh, the, what the words were, but when you took it, the comma out and completely it was, it went changed the meaning. Like, if I remember correctly, it went something like, we oppose tax increases in taxes, comma, which will hinder economic growth. If you take the comma out, um, then it's you, you're only excluding taxes which inhibit economic growth. And the White House apparently 
uh, wanted the comma left out and you yeah. guys wanted the comma in. Yeah. And we were, uh, the White House sent, you'll be interested in this, Drew Lewis and John Bolton to make sure that the platform committee stayed in, uh, in line. And of course, we never had any intention of staying in line. And uh, we quickly disposed of, of John Bolton. And then uh, we, didn't, we didn't want to embarrass Drew because we liked Drew Lewis. But when we finally completed it with the comma, uh, we, uh, we presented Drew at the, the platform with a bow on it. But uh, we were, were they? Huh? They were they were not happy to say the least. Now, somebody said that this comma controversy was less important than the press made it out to be, and that it was kind of a it, it was designed to make the platform hearings interesting and give no. the press something to nah. chew on. No, it was uh, actually it was real. It was it, a real it, oh, yeah. dispute. It was designed by Dave Hoppy and and yours truly. To make the point that yeah. you should not increase yeah. taxes. That's right. And I went on the platform. I went on the meet. Was it uh, when I went on the show with uh, Sam Donaldson? Who was it? What was he on then? Uh, this week. This week with Brinkley, wasn't it? Yeah. And which I said under question him, no, we're not going to uh, be for raising taxes, and we're not going to raise taxes. So, but Baker did not like that. <laughs> and what did Baker say? Um. Uh, he never let me forget it, for, uh, probably till this day. He'd still harass me about it. But I had a great relationship with Jim Baker, even though I came from a different school. And um, I, I, I've said on occasion, I thought uh, the Reagan Revolution ended in, in December of 1980, when the, uh, the Bush people basically took over the White House staff. And uh, Jim Baker didn't appreciate that too much either. But over the years, I grew to respect him. Uh, in fact, years later, uh, I went back to a banker to try to get Bush to come to the Neshoba County Fair. It's not Philadelphia, it's the Neshoba County Fair, it's out in the county. And uh, I was going my, using my usual tricks trying to engineer it, trying to get Bush to come. Finally I called Jim, who was unfortunately belatedly the chairman. Remember he didn't come in and take over the campaign until August and I, I pleaded with him and I pleaded with George W. to get, get Jim involved earlier, I think Jim knew that it was over. But at any rate, I went up talking to him and said, that, you know, that we, this is important, you know, we can get him to go to the Shelby County Fair. And I'll never forget, he said, you want me to give it to you with the bark off? I said, yeah, that's the way we like it in Mississippi. Give it to me straight. He said, he ain't going. So I said, I can understand that. I got the message, thank you very much. And I dropped it, I dropped it, and didn't, didn't push it anymore. Uh, but I got, you know, Jim and I did have some conflicts uh, later on. I remember one time I really got mad at him when he basically said, if Israel wants to talk anymore, our number is 4561414. Remember that? No, what was that about? Was that after, he, after Bush violated the no new taxes agreement? No, no, no. This, is, this is about Israel. Oh. And he had gotten agitated uh, with, uh, with Israel's positioning and basically said, you know, he was tired of messing with them. If they want to talk, here's my number. And boy, I, I thought that was a dumb thing to do. Uh, and Jack did too? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I thought it was uncalled for. And not diplomatic. For a guy ordinarily is extremely diplomatic. It was out of character for, for Jim. Right. Uh, let's, let's go back um, to 1980, the 1980 campaign. Um, some people say that that in December or January, January of 1980 or December of 79, I can't remember which, there, there was a meeting out at Los Angeles International Airport uh, at the Marriott Hotel where Jack, quote unquote, converted Reagan to Kemp Roth. Uh, and other people dispute that Reagan needed any conversion. Uh, what's your... I, I would, wasn't aware of that and wasn't involved in it. Uh, I doubt if he had to convert him, but I think when he explained to him what it was, it, it, you know, it was something that uh, Reagan uh, took to like a duck to water. But I was, you know, I can't remember uh, if Jack and I talked about that, and I was not involved in any way, so I, I can't uh, confirm or deny that that happened or what happened. Okay, so 19, as you say, the, the Bush people basically 
took over took over the, the Reagan White House yeah, staff. Yeah, and they and pushed David me Stockman, aside. And David Stockman. David was, Stockman. Yep. Was a was a apostate who was yeah, and, one and, of you guys. And, and and Darman too. Right. So Kemp Roth starts getting watered down right at the beginning of the of the Reagan administration. How how did Jack Kemp take that? Not well. Uh, and we even conspired to try to uh, have an influence on, on them. We sent one of my uh, people over there to be Stockman's uh, head of congressional relations. At, uh, uh, let me, see, I can remember her name actually is a, a woman from Mississippi that we sent over there to try to talk to, to Stockman. And she'd worked with Stockman. She was on the rules committee with me. Uh, John Lynn Cullen. Remember John Lynn Cullen at Amaring a Bell? And, uh, uh, to try to try to influence uh, Stockman. In fact, they did start trying to water it down. But as time went along, uh, I was I felt that uh, our biggest problem was not Stockman, but it was Darman. Because because he 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 you know right till the very end when when uh, when decisions were being made, he he had a tremendous influence on it. Uh, bad influence, we thought. I did. And I, I'm sure Jack did too. We were not happy with Stockman or Darman, but in the end, uh, Darman became our number one villain. Um, 1982. You, well, Reagan in, in 1981 that you enact the biggest tax cut in American history. Yep. 1982, he comes along and raises taxes by 90. Now let me see. That was uh, was that the Hans Conable, Conable that, Hans. That was 81. Yeah, and then 82. Was the budget Tef cut of, of uh, well, and then we we did the, the the budget bill in eighty one or eighty two too. Graham Latta. Yeah, that was eighty one. Yeah, which was uh, that was a great. I mean, we I think we we cut like eighty billion. We thought that was the greatest thing that ever. Now it's going to be chicken feed. Uh, but uh, yeah, I remember those events. But now, what, what you, okay, so nineteen eighty two comes along, and you remember the eighty one tax bill had all kinds of ornaments on it. Yep. Uh, safe harbor leasing and all that stuff. Yeah. Reagan, because the deficit is big, mm -hmm. Reagan comes along and, and advocates a $98 billion tax increase and I forget it, 10 billion or something mm -hmm. like that in tax mm -hmm. cut, in, mm -hmm. in spending cuts. You're the whip. You, you helped engineer the passage of it, but Jack was against it. Now, I was against it. Um, I get, was it the one the one that I really fought to kill was it was it eighty six the tax reform wasn't it? Yes. I'm trying to get uh, get these two separate. Eighty two you were I've looked this up. Yeah. Eighty two you were whipping uh -huh. in favor of the White House and Jack and was Jack resisting. who's number three leader yep. in the House of Representatives yep. in mm -hmm. that in the yep. Republican conference is against it. Mm -hmm. So how did that work? Well, it would. It was not very comfortable, and and I, that was the occasion. I'm sure when I went up the, the center aisle while the vote was on and trying to, and pleaded with him to come on and and I vote with the with the team so we could win and get it done. He wouldn't do it. But, I, I you know I I didn't. It wasn't a, uh, you know an angry sort of thing because, uh, I I understood. I, I had some some of the same feelings and stuff, and I didn't like. I guess it was the 86th one where I wound up uh, saying I can't, I'm, I can't be for it and announced that uh, I wasn't going to be for it and I turned it over to Tom Leffler who was my chief deputy whip and Tom said I ain't going to do it and I wound up in the Oval Office with Reagan and Jim Baker sitting on the other side of the desk. I got a picture of me sitting there. And he's trying to convince me to be for it, and I'm, I'm saying, Mr. President, I think it's just a tax increase. That's what we, I don't think that's what we came here for. And then he said, Well, Trent, if I can't count on the whip, who can I count on? And I'm sitting there thinking, Good gravy! From my background here, I'm telling a guy I love and admire, and President of the United States, and who do I think I am? And you know, long silence while I was rolling around in my mind. And then I said, okay, Mr. President, I'll do it. I do consider that one of the two worst votes I cast my entire career. Yes, ma'am. Sorry for huh? interrupting. Are y'all recording? Or? Yeah, yes. what you got? Um. When Kemp 
opposed Reagan on tax increases, and he did it again and again and again because ta Reagan raised taxes a lot. In, what happened? Do, I mean, do, he, he, there were reports that he was in the doghouse in the White I, House. I think he was. I think he, he did get in the doghouse uh, at the White House. And I thought my impression, looking back on it, uh, was that he was kind of, uh, you know, on the outs uh, with the White House. Uh, and uh, frankly, uh, it began to take a toll on him in, in, in the House of Representatives, too. How so? Well, some of the, you know, uh, some of the people like uh, Bob Michael were not happy with that. and. Uh, some of the other, what we call old bulls. In those days, I was not one. I, somewhere along the line, I became one. But uh, Jack's passion and his, you know, uh, you know, un unwavering uh, support for uh, taxes that you know would uh, uh, spur growth and oppose tax increases and the burden they put on the economy. Uh, it, it, had, uh, it had weakened him uh, within uh, the ranks there in the House, and I think that's one reason why, you know, his run for the presidency did not take off like I thought it would, I hoped it would. Did you ever hear Reagan say anything to you no. about all that? No. No. Never, Baker, never Reagan. Uh, Baker, there was, you know, there got to be a little bit of a testiness between uh, Jack and and uh, and Jim, and uh, <laughs> it would, but it was it wasn't it, it was typical of Jack. It, it was not ugly. I remember one time. I don't know why in the world we were in the uh, cabinet room, but Tricia, my wife, came in, and uh, Jack and Baker were standing over there on the other side of the room, and Tricia goes over, and she starts to speak to Jack, and then. And Jim Baker speaks. I said, "Oh, Jim Baker!" And she just turns right away from Jack, and shakes hands with Jim Baker. And Baker loved it and harassed Jack about it. And Jack was crestfallen that she was so eager to pass him by and and, and acknowledge Jim Baker. So we 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 kidded and laughed about that for years. And Baker always loved it. So there was that kind of a relationship. But I, I think clearly, uh, Baker viewed uh, Jack as problematic. And how did Jack... But, but I never, by then, I must also say, uh, by the late 80s, uh, maybe it was even 80, 87 or 80, uh, 87, 88, I remember going in there in, in that same room, in that cabinet room, and I went over to speak to the president, and he looked at me like he didn't know who I was. And I thought it was so strange, because, I mean, I'd been with him a lot, and, and to his credit, he met with the leadership a lot, just about every Tuesday at 9 o'clock, and I hated him because trying to get to the White House at 8 o'clock coming from Northern Virginia, was, I mean 9 o'clock, was always a pain in the rump. And I thought then it was curious. I think he was beginning to actually have the early signs because it was the blankest look I've ever seen. Um, so in in uh, in December of 1985, this is when the House Ways and Means Committee, Rust Denny Rustenkowski, had passed a version of tax reform, which the whole Republican conference practically was against, including you, right? And you defeated the rule. Yeah, with the help of Dick Cheney, by the way. So then. Uh, Reagan comes up to the to the conference the day after the challenger, and he had been to been to something, or it was right around the challenger thing, and the whole country was in a state of shock and mourning. And it was after he'd given that unbelievable speech that Peggy Noonan wrote for him, and he came up there and we met in uh, one of the uh, committee rooms there in the Rayburn Building, the entire conference, and. Uh, Basically, he, he turned us all around. I mean, he was ashen, and he was obviously emotional, and he pleaded with us to, to get it done. And uh, Michael, of course, uh, stepped up and committed to, to get it done. And uh, he flipped us, and we, we got it done. You included? Yeah. Uh, okay. So, and then tax reform ultimately passed? Yeah. 
uh, and what what did he say to you? Because it was a closed meeting. Um, he he just you know I can't remember. I, I remember I can visually see him up there on the podium because it was one of those committee rooms where he had the two levels and he was up on the second level. Um, but it, it, you know I think it was the, the the timing and the circumstances and his demeanor, and you know by then we you know people like me uh, I'm. I guess I'm kind of the old school. I believe in following the leader, and uh, you know I was I guess I was emotionally attached to him, and he I'm sure he was saying we had to do it for our economy and all of that, and well uh, we did it. But that was one of the, that was one of the, uh, the, the things that eventually got me in trouble, because I like Reagan, I even though I disagreed with him. Uh, Sometime I disagree with him, and, and I voted to override one of his veto twice. Of them. I fought him on on <laughs> the highway bill, uh, which we overrode him on, and uh, and then I think that was in the House, and then on the textile bill, I said no, nope. you know I'm not I'm not going to uh, work to sustain your veto, and we didn't, we overrode it, so I'd get tangled up with him a little bit every now and then. Um. Okay. I was loyal to him, but I had a, a higher loyalty to my constituency. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, 84 convention, when you're the, you're the platform chairman, mm -hmm. did you have Jack become the, the uh, defense subcommittee chairman to help out with 88, or just because? No, because he, uh, he was on the platform committee. He was on the defense appropriation subcommittee um, of the people, and by the way, Hoppy and I, loaded that platform committee. We, we decided who we wanted on the platform committee. We called him and said, get on the platform committee. And Ben Weber was on it. Uh, uh, Jack was on it. I think Newt was on it. Uh, uh, Jesse Helms was on it. Uh, it, was, uh, it was quite a, quite a group. And, uh, but, uh, it was, and, uh, but I did want to, part of my goal was to try to help em embellish his credentials, not just as the Johnny One note on the, the gold standard or, or, or tax issues and, and, and growth issues, but you know, expand the portfolio. But I'm in ret as I think back on it now, I'm not. Maybe I had a vision of how it would help him uh, in the presidential uh, effort, but really, I think it was just that of the people on the platform committee, he was the best choice. Um, going to '88, uh, did endorsing Kemp help you or hurt you in Mississippi? Um, it didn't hurt me. Um, you know, I did it early on, too, uh, but I didn't, there was nobody else stirring around to challenge me in the Republican primary, so, uh, and then uh, once uh, Bush became the nominee, I mean, obviously, um, you know, I was advocating for him, and I remember one of the biggest events I had. Uh, toward the end of the campaign was in Macomb, Mississippi, the home of my opponent, Congressman Wayne Dowdy. And I remember really emphasizing, you know, how important it was that George Bush get elected and that he have a, a Senate he could work with. So, I mean, as time went along, I, I, I got in line and, and advocated uh, for him as much as I could. But I, I don't think it, uh, I never felt it hurt me in Mississippi. I think in Mississippi by then, people knew that I had a, uh, you know, kind of a, a personal friendship with Jack, and um, I'd had him down there on more than one occasion. And uh, how uh, did you decide that you were going? Plus, you know, Mississippians never were super califrigic excited about uh, Bush forty one. Right. So rather than it hurt me, it, it you know it became a uh, a sales job. In fact, uh, at the convention in eighty when Reagan picked Bush at the convention, I almost had a blowout. Uh, I was chairman of the Mississippi delegation, and I had a, you know, people like Billy Munger, I had to take them out of, off the convention floor, back in the back of the, uh, the chamber, and, and say, you know, we, this is, he's, he's our man, he's made his choice, and we've got to vote for him. And I was going to let a guy named Jerry Gilbert from Laurel, who had been an early Bush supporter, actually, uh, you know, do the uh, vote uh, for the Mississippi delegation, but because of the fracas that was about to break out, I wound up 
casting the Mississippi delegation vote. Uh, but it was, uh, it was not well received uh, in Mississippi Republican circles in 1980. Who was, who was the favorite? You know, probably, I, I, again, I'd have to go back and, and think about it. Because Jack even. was talked about in 80 uh, as, as a possibility. There were demonstrations at the convention for I think Jack. the delegation, the Mississippi delegation, wanted Paul Laxalt, as I recall. Um, but I, I don't, I, you know, I don't remember. But you didn't specific. participate in any camp demonstrations at the no, convention? No, no, no. Look, I, look I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an order sort of guy. I'm an organization sort of guy. I thought Reagan was our man, it was his choice, and we were going to support his pick. So uh, looking to 88 now, your, your gang in the, in, in, the, in the House, because you hadn't yet, you were running for the Senate, but you hadn't. So how, at what stage does the gang start forming for Kemp for 88? I think it was in 87. I remember we started talking then, and uh, I think by then we had our our little Kimosabi group. Uh, oh, uh, no, what was it? Where we called? What you is it? You were later. You were later the Amigos. The, the Amigos. I think yeah. that was that was not. It United. was later on. I guess we started the meeting. I guess after he had gone on to to HUD, but the group was this basically the same. You know, we started to form around Jack in '87. So I don't think it was earlier than that. Your announcement. Your announcement on the House floor. Tell, tell me about that and how. No, it this is a video. Actually, it was. Uh, um, it was. I'm trying to remember. Where, I think it was in one of the committee rooms on the House side. You know, some of your people sent me the video. I'd never seen it, but it was. I introduced Jack, and we had everybody lined up on the platform. And Newt was there, and Bob Smith was there, and Joanne and the family came in, and we had a huge crowd uh, there that day. So and. That would, I guess, that would have been, that would have been an early '88, probably. Okay, um, so you were you were off running for the Senate, so you didn't have much to do with the '88 campaign, no, I think. Uh, no, right. Okay, but but you don't think it was well organized? No, it wasn't well organized. And who do you blame for that? I always blame the candidate. <laughs> it's just not Jack's forte. Jack, you know, was he was always his his own uh, manager. His his own, his own greatest inspiration and his own greatest problem. <laughs> he was just an undisciplined candidate, I'm sure, and uh, um, probably wouldn't prep the way he needed to. I mean, like we talked about the, the Gore debate when I was sure he was just going to eat Gore alive and Gore beat him when they were running for vice president, or Jack was. But I, I really didn't, I mean, uh, beginning in, in March of, of 88, I was consumed uh, in the state Senate campaign. Right. Um, so, w did Jack consult you about the HUD, taking the HUD job? Uh, I think he did. I remember the thing that I most remember about Jack, though, was when Bob Dole called me to ask me what I thought. Uh, about, I think he... 96. Uh, yeah. yeah. And I remember standing, uh, I was on the cell phone, standing outside the leader's office there in the Capitol, and of course I was a big advocate for Jack. I thought that that's, I thought Dole needed him, I thought it would bring some youth and vigor uh, to, to Dole's campaign. Dole was hesitant, but uh, I guess, uh, I, I, you know, I was comfortable with doing it, I hope I did did him a, a service by advocating Jack. And I, other than kind of blowing the, uh, the vice presidential debate, I thought Jack was a pretty, you know, he did bring life and vigor, vigor and energy. And I must confess that the, at the convention, this would have been in 96. Six. I had just been elected majority leader. But I remember they had a rally there at the hotel where we were all staying. And I, I, I was up by the pool. You probably were familiar with the area, looking down on the crowd and listening to Bob, Jack and listening to Bob and thinking, you know, I wish, I wish Jack were on top of that ticket and thinking that with, with Jack maybe he could save the ticket. Do you think Jack would have been a good president? Uh, 
I don't think he'd have been a particularly good vice president, number one. And I, I, as I look back on it, I, I, I guess I have my doubts about what kind of president he would have been. He'd have had to have strong people around him. Uh, and even then, he would have been hard to control. Uh, kind of reminds me, you know, a lot of people were shocked that I was so aggressively for John McCain so early because McCain and I had fought like tigers. A typical Scottish Klansman. His family, the McCain's farm, was right down from my mother's farm. The Watsons, the McCain's, the McCaleb's, the Miss Kelly's, the McLeod's, all clans lived in Carroll County, Mississippi. And so John and I had a long history. In fact, my uncle was elected to the state senate in 1952. His campaign manager was Joe McCain, John's uncle. So a long history there, but I fought him like a tiger with campaign finance reform and a lot of other issues. Jack and we were tangled up a lot. And then some people, and I remember Bob Livingston asked me, he said, why in the world are you for McCain? And I said, because I think he might actually get elected. And it's pretty scary. And if he does, I want to make sure I can talk to him and tell him when I think he's you know, don't fix to do something really dumb. Uh, and if Hillary had been the nominee, I still think, and if the economy hadn't tanked right when it did, it, it, McCain could have won. But it's kind of that sort of thing. Uh, he'd have had, some, had to have uh, some strong people around him. Jack had the vision, but, but he wasn't a mechanics guy. Uh, and he'd have had to have people that could work with the Congress and could uh, help communicate his message. And, and the main thing is he'd have had to have a chief of staff that uh, would have had to been a Tiger, but uh, but he had so many great uh, assets and uh, uh, so many good ideas. And, uh, he's the kind of a you know was the kind of inspirational leader that we haven't had many of in recent years. Okay, let me. I, there's there's one unpleasant subject that I need to cover with you, and that's the 2002 when you when you when you made your remarks about yep. Strom Thurmond mm -hmm. and Jack attacked you, for, yeah. right? Well, more or less uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the New York Times. And of course, uh, I confronted him and we had some pretty, uh, pretty tough conversations. And, and then he gave me advice, which m uh, most of it was bad. <laughs> um, and if I hadn't have taken some of his advice, the, the thing, it might have turned out uh, differently. Um, so, and so, I put so in, it, we, it was, we had a very strange relationship there for, for a while, but I got a letter up there on my desk from Jack, where we basically, uh, you know, uh, made peace. Okay, let me just walk through it a little bit. So when when you said that, or were quoted as saying that, that uh, Strom Thurmond should have been elected uh, and it became a big flap, Kemp did not warn you in advance that he was going to say that it was inexplicable? No, he, he, I think he was in New York and got sort of bushwhacked by a reporter and said some unhelpful things and then called. Now it wasn't it, it wasn't weeks or even days. It was, you know, this all happened like on a Thursday, and then and things started blowing up on Tuesday, and it was probably, you know, maybe you know, maybe Thursday or Friday of that week or early the next week where we had some long conversation. And he was urging me to do some things. Didn't I actually do an interview with you? Yeah. Uh, what did he advise you to do that was a mistake? Oh, it was the, you know, it was what you would expect, Jack. Uh, come, come clean, apologize, you know, correct what you had to say, uh, you know, just, just a meal culpa all the way. Uh, it wasn't so much uh, that, it, that, but it also he advised me to, to, like, go on BET, which turned out to be a disaster. Uh, what, why? Well, it was just, uh, you know, it was, it was not the right venue and, uh, you know, some of the things that I said there actually caused uh, more, you know, more difficulty on the other side of the equation. And uh, so it, it just, it was... It sounded as though you were groveling or something? Yeah, like that. well, it was, even, it was even worse than that. I was pointing out some of the things that I'd voted for and been for, which some people like Jim Inhofe said, what the heck are you thinking? <laughs> So, you know, uh, it, but the main thing was uh, one of the things I should have known and nobody really told me at the time, the one person that could have told me was actually in England, so I couldn't talk to him, but uh, let me see how much I can say this, but 
Harry Reid said something recently that was a little uh, in the same venue. And I sent word to him, uh, correct yourself, apologize once, and say nothing more. He did, and it went away. Part of my problem was I felt so badly about it that I was being advised. I, re I kept apologizing and trying to, you know, to say I'm sorry and, you know, repeatedly. And every time I did, it activated the story again. And so it's one of the basic rules in Washington that I learned the hard way and others maybe have learned from watching my example. You make a boo-boo, admit it, apologize, and say no more. And so what kind of a rift did it create in your relationship with Jack? Serious. You know, I really felt like he had, you know, uh, betrayed me, let me down, and, uh, you know, uh, real dis really disappointed. And how long did it take to patch it up? Oh, uh, let's see, when did that, I guess that happened in 2002. Two. Um, I'm not sure we got it completely patched up till 2007 or eight. You didn't talk all that time? No, we talked a little bit, but I was, you know, I pretty much had him in the doghouse. <laughs> so did you ever have real words about it? No, neither, neither one of us have that kind of uh, uh, disposition, I don't think. Uh, he knew I was disappointed, and I think more than anything else, I didn't have much to say to him. So how did you patch it up? He wrote a really, really, you know, nice letter and talked to me. It was just a, you know, very, very uh, personal sort of thing, and I thought, uh, and I responded, I hope in kind, about how much that he had meant to me and how much he had meant to the party and the country. And, you know, when you put something in writing like he did and like I did, then it's over. You said uh, in, in, our, in our panel discussion that your shared religious faith helped you over difficulties. Is this what you were talking sure. about? Sure. Hmm. Uh, Jack had some difficulties. And... Uh, Personal you know, or...? Yeah. And, uh, you know, I always reached out to him. and uh, I remember we had some meetings up in my little capital office with Lloyd Ogilvy. Some pretty, pretty uh, deep, emotional, spiritual conversations. Uh, with, with when I thought Jack needed it, and uh, I think it helped. Is that anything you can talk about? No. Okay. Um, okay. So um, the amigos. Yeah. The amigos met where? Mexican restaurant. Mexican rest restaurant up there uh, uh, on that uh, corner where you've got. Um, the Hart Building on one side, and uh, right around the corner there, kind of across the street from, I guess, where the Heritage Foundation is. Uh, I can't even remember what the name of that place was. But, uh, and I think J Jack was the one that <laughs> wanted us to meet there. We always thought he was a little crazy. But, uh, and, it, and I, you know, and we, we've talked about who the Amigos were. It was, it was Jack and Newt and Vin. I think Coach was in the group. I think Kyle was in the group. And me. Connie so. Mack was in the group. And Connie, yeah, sure. Yeah, Connie for sure. This was when he was HUD secretary. Yeah. So what did you talk about? Why, why did it get It's just and, friends. Uh -huh. We would get together and uh, usually we'd, you know, we'd get into pretty heated discussions. You know, Jack would always stir things up. And, uh, uh, but um, we, you know, we had uh, kind of missed being together as much as we used to be, you know, on the floor of the house or um, even, you know, during the, the years when he was at HUD, you know, we, we wanted to visit with him. I remember one time, I can't remember exactly, I think I maybe told her the story, maybe I didn't. We met in Connie Mack's office, and we were pretty full of ourselves, pretty excited about the fact that by then, uh, Connie and I were both in leadership, and, and Newt was uh, in leadership, but this thing was before we became speaker and leader, and Jack was at HUD, and uh, so we were kind of just there to kind of celebrate what was going on. <laughs> and Newt announced that, just out of the blue, that, he, well, he'd be running for president. And we were all sitting there thinking, where did that come from? And by the way, here's Kemp. If anybody in this group would be running for president, it'd be more likely to be Kemp than Newt. 
Well, we found out this year uh, that actually Newt <laughs> did plan on running for president. So you, it, it was just like a social gathering? Yeah. Or, yeah. Oh, yeah. It was just purely. So it was. I don't. I don't think there was anything substantive about it. Um, I'm sure Jack harassed us about being more supportive of some of the HUD programs. And, you know, Ben's wife worked over there for him as, a, I guess, personal assistant. Uh, but it was just uh, old, old friends that uh, we developed those friendships when we were on the house together in 78. There was, there was a moment when Jack did tell you guys that he was going to run for president. Was, yeah. Was it for 96? But I don't, I don't remember when that was. I think it was September of, like, uh, 90, 93, I think. It was early. And he and supposedly, the newspaper accounts I've read have you asking him, are you going to run? And he said yes. Do you remember anything like this? And when? What was the I date? I thought it was September of 93. Early. I don't remember that one. Okay. So, I would think I'm getting a little see now, but that was 20 years ago, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so, Hard to believe. So how, how far did that ever get? His, and why did he not run in 96? You know, I, I, again, I apologize, but I, I just don't remember uh, why. Uh, I think, but for one thing, he didn't get much encouragement. Um, you know, after the aborted thing in 88, um, they just, uh, you know, I, it just didn't, it just didn't look viable. And uh, who else was running in, in that year? Um, in 96. I, well, Lamar ran, um, um, I can't, I, I can't remember either. <laughs> um, Baker. Baker, yeah, Baker and started Dole, out course, running and then, yeah. then dropped out. But uh, but it was L Lamar Alexander was the one who, and Pat Buchanan, remember? Yeah, oh yeah, the Pitchfork crew. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, but I don't remember why Jack didn't get in there. It's just that um, you know things had not gone well in '88, and he'd sort of been, um, I, I guess you could say, he'd kind of been out of out of the loop during that period of time. So when, when did you first hear that Jack might be Dole's running mate? Well, there, you know, there were a lot of us that advocated it. Uh, I think probably even Connie Mack uh, was mentioned too. And um, so I, th I think we'd kind of been advocating it and th hoping it would happen and hearing it, but uh, the first time I, you know, realized that it was very serious and likely to happen was when Dole called me and asked me to, what I thought about it. Uh, you know, I had been Dole's whip, and while he was opposed to me being whip and didn't know what to think about me for a long time, by the time he left, we'd gotten pretty, be pretty close. So it wasn't unexpected that he would call because he knew my, you know, my relationship with Jack. And. What did you say? You said. Oh, I thought it, I told him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I thought it. Uh, and he probably, knowing Dole, probably asked me if he would, you know, if he, if he could control him or would he be a, a reliable partner. And I, I said, I, I'm sure I said I thought he would be all of the above. And I thought, you know, as I said earlier, that he'd bring, bring, a, you know, a level of, of, of interest and support and energy that was was going to be needed. Um, okay. And Joanne and, and Elizabeth, I think, had a really good relationship, too. Better than Jack and Bob yeah. Dole did. Yeah. Because they were, they were oil and water. For they years. were. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Jack was the, the leader of the House Schnitz. I believe that uh, uh, we were called, I think uh, Dole referred to us as mentors, and some people referred to Dole as uh, the... Uh, Barracuda, and the, I think that was the terms that they used. It was a fish analogy, the Barracuda and the Minnows. And, of course, that was a shot at Newt and the house guys. Uh, when I was over in the house, I remember Carlogus was one of the ones that talked about that. And I didn't, I didn't take well to that, you know. Uh, 
I was, you know, we were good friends with Newt, too. And at that point, I was not a fan of the Senate, <laughs> to say the least. You became one. Well, I, be I'm all, I, I always become an institutionalist. Um, but, you know, in the, in the nine, late 90s and early part of the century, we, we were doing some good things in the Senate. Um, okay. In what, fact, what, it really what? gets my goat every time I read in the paper about a, uh, you know, the, uh, the unemployment level, the growth numbers, the balanced budget, and all the wonderful stuff that Bill Clinton did. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> we had to make him do most of that stuff. Um, speaking of Clinton, um, how did Jack feel about impeachment? I don't know that I really even ever discussed that with Jack. It's just I bet I did, but I can't rec recall it, you know. I remember, first of all, I was sick at my stomach when I sat there at my house in Pascagoula watching the Senate on a Saturday vote for the three articles of impeachment and realizing, well, I was not happy with the way that was done, and then I realized that... The House, you mean? Yeah, the House. Uh, that uh, it was sitting in my lap. And I called uh, Tom Daschle the next day on Sunday and said, Tom, we have a constitutional job to do, and uh, I hope we can do it uh, in a respectful and, and an honorable way, and uh, I'd like to be able to talk to you and see if we can figure out how to get this thing done. That's a, that's a whole other story, too, but uh, it's not about Jack, so right. that's why I was probably so consumed with trying to figure out how to get through that uh, that I didn't, I don't I, I probably talked to Jack, but I cannot remember. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, at, in in later years, post ninety six, um, how close were you and Jack? Uh, we we talked a lot, and you know, um, Jack was, you know, I can remember one conversation um, in my dining room there in our row house on Capitol Hill when Jack called and said, you know, you're the you're you're the the guy, the only guy that's left that can get some of our our policies in place, and uh, of course, you know, uh, we did a lot of that um, in, in uh, the, the 90s. Uh, everything we did, uh, you remember, it was to get the budget under control and encourage growth and lead to a balanced budget and surpluses, but we did it without raising taxes. Of course, Clinton had raised taxes, you know, by one vote, House and Senate, in 90, whatever that would have been, one. One. Uh, so, you know. The fact of the matter was, there was an awful lot of revenue in there, but we did everything else that had to be done to keep unemployment at like 4.2 percent and, and growth going strong. And then, of course, in 2001, I think when I talked to Jack a lot, when we were going after the, uh, uh, the Bush tax cuts, the first round of Bush tax cuts, which we got done uh, by the skin of our teeth before we lost the majority. He was supportive of that. Oh, yeah, right? absolutely. And then we came back in 2003 and got another round of them. And he, he loved all of that. All right. what, did, what did he think about George W. Bush in general and about the Bush presidency? W. I, I'm, uh, I'm trying to remember uh, our discussions about that. Uh, you know, I don't recall. Uh, having that many uh, conversations about that, my perception would be probably that uh, that he was not a huge fan, but thought that uh, uh, he liked the compassionate conservative term. You know, that kind of would, you know, Jack was a compassionate conservative. Um, and I think that he appreciated the, the fact that he, you know, he did uh, serve in the dad's, you know, administration and uh, was but, and handled himself pretty well at HUD, I thought. He was frustrated at HUD, wasn't he? Well, yeah, he was, yeah. But but the, but he was frustrated because he had to stay in the traces, which is what you're supposed to do. You're a cabinet secretary. You're not a free agent. You're not a congressman or a senator or a presidential candidate. You're a cabinet secretary working for a president. And so I'm well. I'm sure he was frustrated with some of it, and and of course I disagreed with him. You know, I mean, I, I disagreed with probably 80 percent of the programs at HUD. And so I was not a you know a supporter of a lot of what Jack 
wanted to do or tried to do, I'm sure. But we never got in a real tanglement that I can remember. But typically of me, I was against most of the programs I had, but I tried to get as many of the programs as I could in Mississippi. <laughs> Which always <laughs> would agitate Jack, you know. <laughs> there, there, here he is, you know, Al D'Amato trying to get some more pothole money. Yeah, that's right, man. So when the Amigos would meet, did, did he ever um, talk about Darman and Sununu? Who, oh, yeah, who we, were, oh, yeah. Who were oh, thwarting yeah. him? Oh, yeah, we, we, oh, yeah, I'm sure we all uh, blasted them uh, you know, freely. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, when did you find out that he was sick? How did you find out? Uh, I, I'm sure I, I heard it, it, and I can't remember whether I called Jack uh, or he called me, but I remember we had a conversation, and um, it was, I guess the terminology would be, it was sort of fatalistic, but I mean, he was, uh, it's a fact, and you know, um, uh, but uh, I'm going to, I'm going to fight this, and uh, Trisha, I'm sh uh, I know, talked to Joanne a good bit. I didn't really realize how bad it was. Um, and, you know, I was shocked when he, he actually passed away. And When did I, you last talk to him? It was while he was, you know, he was there at home basically sitting in that chair, which you probably have uh, seen him sit in. Uh, it was the usual stuff. We were always kidding each other about um, our level of education and the, the words we would use. You know, t you know, typical Jack, uh, what book he was reading, and so I don't remember exactly when it was. It, but it was not too long before he passed away. And I'll always remember that memorial at uh, Washington Cathedral. I mean, the, the crowd and the diversity of the the crowd, both politically and racially, and you know everything. It was, a, it was a beautiful tribute to him, I thought. Right. Okay. Anything I've missed? No, I probably gave you a lot more you didn't need, but uh, <laughs> we had some great times uh, together. And uh, he certainly influenced my, uh, my politics um, in the late 70s and, and, and my career in the Senate. And while I got myself in trouble with that, uh, you know, the Strom Thurmond thing, uh, some of the things I learned from Jack what got me in trouble in other ways too. My, you know, I, the, the things that I advocated for, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of the, the old bulls did not like. And uh, also, uh, I guess I became a little bit too much of a pragmatist, uh, maybe more than Jack, where I would. I was so determined to get, trying to get things done that um, I was willing to, to make deals. And he, ra he harassed me about that some too. But the problem today is we have no deal makers. Yeah. Makes me sad. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. All right. Appreciate it.